Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Simon Levi? He's the subject of a Netflix documentary titled The Tinder Swindler. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Shimon Hayut was born near Tel Aviv, Israel. It's not clear when he was born. Some sources say 1988, others say 1990 and 1991. He fled from Israel in 2011 after being charged with theft, fraud, and forgery. He ended up in Finland, where he started running a criminal scheme where he defrauded women. In 2015, he was arrested and convicted for defrauding three women. He ended up serving two years in prison. When he was released in 2017, he made his way back to Israel. Before the authorities could arrest him, he fled to Europe. At some point, he changed his name to Simon Levi. This is where the Netflix documentary picks up the story. According to the documentary, here's what happened. A Norwegian woman named Cecilia, who lived in London, found Simon on Tinder in January of 2018. She was immediately impressed by his apparent wealth. He had posted pictures wearing nice clothes and posing with expensive items like jets and sports cars. He claimed he was a diamond dealer for a company owned by his father called LLD Diamonds. Simon met with Cecilia at a local bar and said that he had to travel to Bulgaria for business. He had to leave right away. He invited Cecilia to come with him, which she did. The two had sex in a hotel room in Bulgaria before she returned to London. She didn't believe that she would hear from Simon again, but she wanted to. She liked him. He had swept her off her feet. She was pleasantly surprised when he reached out to her. The two started communicating frequently. He asked her to become his girlfriend, and she agreed. Around the same time, a woman named Pernilla selected Simon on Tinder. She was also impressed by his apparent wealth. He invited her to his residence in Amsterdam, and she accepted. When she met him, she thought that he dressed elegantly, but was a little short. They ate expensive food and talked quite a bit. She found him to be a good listener. He made a romantic move, but she rejected him because it didn't feel right. There was no romantic energy. She returned home, but she missed him, and they started communicating frequently. So at this time, Simon is telling Cecilia that she is his girlfriend. He's friends with Pernilla, and later we find out he's also seeing a woman named Eileen. He appeared to be maintaining several other romantic interests at this time. Simon moved into the next phase of his scam with Cecilia. He sent her a picture of a man he referred to as Peter, who was supposedly his bodyguard. Peter appears to be injured in the photograph. Simon makes it look like somebody was trying to attack him and ended up injuring Peter instead. Simon's life is in danger. He has many enemies that are out to get him because of his diamond dealing. Due to security concerns, like his enemies tracking him, he asks Cecilia if he can use her American Express card. She agrees, thinking that this is a safety issue. She wants to protect Simon. He quickly maxes out the card. He asks her to bring $25,000 in cash to Amsterdam. She gets a loan for the money and brings it to him. He keeps telling her that what she is doing is keeping him safe from these mysterious enemies. American Express eventually started denying the card. Simon asked Cecilia to contact them and tell them she was using the card. The transactions were valid. He even sent her pay stubs as if she was working for his company. The pay stubs displayed an exorbitant salary, which allowed her to increase her limits on the card. Simon uses the money that he's getting from Cecilia to travel all over Europe and party with a new girlfriend, as well as with his friend Pernilla. He explains to Cecilia that he needs to maintain this party lifestyle for his business. His image is an important part of his job. Altogether, Cecilia had borrowed $250,000 and given it to Simon. She told Simon she really needed to be reimbursed. He gave her a check for half a million dollars. She tried to cash it, 
without success. Simon told her that he gave her the check. What else could he do? He believed he had fulfilled his obligation. It didn't matter if the check was bouncing. Cecilia reported what happened to American Express. They told her that Simon was a con artist. She moved back to Norway and lived with her mother, facing loans from nine different banks that she could not pay. She checked herself into a mental health facility. At this point, Simon focused his efforts on Pernilla. He basically ran the same scam. Over time, she sends him $40,000. He writes her a check for $100,000. It never clears. She doesn't notice this immediately and pays for his flights on her American Express card. A journalist from Norway, who had been alerted by Cecilia, contacted Pernilla and informed her that Simon was a con artist. She meets with Simon in Munich to help the reporters photograph Simon. He gives her a Rolex watch to pay off his debt. When she returns home, she found out the watch was a fake. She called Simon and accused him of fraud. He threatened her in return. The reporters published the story about Simon Levi. His girlfriend of 14 months, Eileen, who I had mentioned before, read the article. She noticed that Simon used the exact same words with her as he used with the other alleged victims. He also sent the same photograph of the injured bodyguard, Peter. Eileen had given Simon $140,000. She notified the police about Simon's activity. Intent on getting at least some of her money back, she pretended that she still believed in Simon. She was able to persuade Simon to give her his expensive clothes so that she could sell them and give the money to him. She meets him in Prague, takes the clothing, sells them, and keeps the money. Simon isn't too happy about this. In July of 2019, Simon takes a flight to Athens, Greece. Eileen notifies the police, and they arrest him there. He is extradited to Israel, and in December of that same year, he was convicted of the theft, fraud, and forgery charges from 2011. Simon was sentenced to 15 months in prison. He was released in May of 2020 after serving only five months. His early release was due to concerns about coronavirus outbreaks among prisoners and good behavior. According to the documentary, after being released, Simon was doing quite well. He had a new girlfriend who was a model, although she now claims that they have broken up. Based on posts to his Instagram account, it appears as though Simon is still preoccupied with a luxury lifestyle. Simon is wanted for various fraud and forgery offenses in Norway, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. The authorities believe he may have defrauded victims out of about $10 million from 2017 to 2019 alone. He has also been reported to the police in several other countries. There are stories about him posing as a pilot, arms dealer, a secret agent, and an heir to an Israeli airline. Simon told reporters that all the women who have accused him of fraud and theft did so for personal reasons. He suggested that maybe their hearts were broken during their relationship with him. He is threatening to sue Netflix and the newspaper in Norway that broke the story. Simon claims that they have defamed him. Now moving to my analysis. There are many elements to the story that stand out to me. I will go through each one of them here. Item number one, like so many con artists, Simon started his criminal career in an unsophisticated manner. The crimes he committed in Israel, for which he was imprisoned, included taking a checkbook from a family when he was working as a babysitter and stealing a checkbook when he was working as a handyman. I doubt he was using a grandiose backstory at this time, like he probably didn't say he was an heir to a babysitting fortune. When he advanced his scheme, like in Europe with the women mentioned in the documentary, he still retained simplistic components, like his grandiose and obvious lies about security concerns from mysterious enemies. Item number two, during his alleged crime spree across Europe, Simon did not avoid contact with his victims, no matter what stage he was in, as far as his scheme. Even when his victims knew he was a con artist, he continued to defend himself and threaten them. Most con artists like this cut off contact with the victim once they're discovered. They don't continue to have discussions. They realize this could lead to more problems in court if they're ever arrested. Simon appears to have characteristics of grandiose narcissism. He is overconfident, dominant, sensation-seeking, angry, and arrogant. 
he also has characteristics of Machiavellianism. Simon was calculating and able to delay gratification, like he would wait for about a month after meeting a potential victim before asking for money. Item number three, when Pernilla rejected Simon's romantic advance, he did not respond adversely. He didn't appear to be offended that she was not attracted to him. He continued to cultivate the relationship as a friendship in order to separate her from her money. Resistance to criticism is another characteristic of grandiose narcissism. Item number four, Simon understood how to make himself appear attractive. It was all about the image of a jet-set playboy billionaire. He had pictures of himself wearing expensive clothes and watches, standing next to jets, luxury cars, and sports cars, standing on yachts. He had pictures of himself with attractive women. He understood the meaning of the phrase, image is everything. Simon wasn't particularly physically attractive, but his wealthy appearance more than compensated for this deficit. His victims believed that he had the money for a party lifestyle, and he did. It just wasn't his money. His strategy was to overwhelm his victims with the promise of having a life of luxury and excitement, including traveling all over Europe. He proved he was important by having a bodyguard and a business associate. So he had thought carefully through his image and was able to maintain it. Now moving to the final item, number five. Sometimes when people hear of scams like this, ones which feature a romantic component, they assume that the con artist must be a sophisticated individual with a keen sense of romance. They are choosing a series of words based on their highly developed empathy. Words that no victim can resist because of the romantic connection and intensity which they inspire. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Simon was not empathic, insightful, or sensitive, and his romantic gestures were over-the-top and obvious, like sending 100 roses. When listening to some of his voice messages and reading some of his text messages, the lack of sophistication is clear. His communications are simplistic and attack basic desires. For example, looking at the letter that he wrote to Eileen around the time that she was taking his expensive clothes to sell, he said something to the effect of, thank you for not giving up on our love. It would be an honor to marry you and have kids. Help me. I'm worth it. A lack of romantic insight is not unique to Simon. Many romance con artists have the same deficit. Common scams involving romance often only involve written communication and photographs. No video or in-person meetings. Yet these types of scams are frequently successful as well. I've seen a few of these scams where it's clear that the con artist was nothing like the person in the photographs, which they sent to the victim. For example, they might send a photograph of a 55-year-old British man wearing an expensive suit, someone who looks like they're employed in some tall building in the center of a city, but in reality, the con artist is a Russian teenager living in his mother's basement. The written messages transmitted by the con artist contain disjointed canned paragraphs. They don't even line up with what the victim is saying in response to the messages. There's no semblance of a true conversation. It's like parallel communication. The con artist is saying one thing and the victim is saying another. The two transmissions are unconnected. What amazes me about these cases is that even when the victim finds out the person who they are talking to is a con artist, it doesn't necessarily diminish a feeling of love. Even if the victim finds out that the con artist doesn't even speak the same language and did not write the messages, they can still believe they are in love. The victims are falling in love with the words they need to hear, not words that were generated out of genuine love and respect. They betray their own desperation to feel special. One could connect this back to the story of Simon Levi. Perhaps his victims were simply in a vulnerable place. They needed to believe that some heir to a diamond fortune believed them to be special. They wanted validation from somebody they admired. It didn't matter if Simon's messages were disjointed, clumsy, overly sentimental, and appeared to be written below a second grade level. Just the fact that he was interested in them was all they needed. Simon wasn't successful at cheating people because he had a gift for romance. 
but rather because he knew how to exploit shallow romantic partner selection criteria. The wealthy appearance that I talked about in item number four was all he required. He just needed to reach the right people. Simon could not manipulate most people, but he could manipulate some, and he knew what attracted those specific people. Those are my thoughts on the case of Simon Levi. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.